All right, Shama, thank you for doing this. Uh, for those people who don't know you, I know that your name is probably familiar to some and maybe your, um, your handle of micro president is maybe even more familiar. Uh, just give people a little bit of background on who you are and uh, how you are associated with, uh, with Bitcoin Cash. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Shama Chancellor. I've uh, been a software engineer for almost 20 years. Um, I got involved with Bitcoin Cash shortly after the fork. Uh, I'd known Omri for a while. And so I, I helped out with Bitcoin ABC for a little over a year. And uh, yeah, I've moved on mostly to do other stuff, work on some other projects now, but uh, that's how I've been associated with Bitcoin Cash um, for uh, basically since August of 2017, like August 17th or 7th, I think is when I got involved. I kind of heard about it right after from Josh Ellathorpe and mm -hmm. uh, I used to work with him as well. Uh, so. So we were talking uh, beforehand, and the reason why I wanted to do this is because it's, an issue had come up that, that seemed notable to me because it was kind of a weird issue. It was something that people have been talking about for a while, including myself. I even went back on some tweets and was like looking at it. But it's, it has to do with the function in Bitcoin of being able to, what, I guess what we could call chain unconfirmed UTXOs, unconfirmed transactions. So basically, while a transaction is still in the mempool, I can spend the output from that as a new input, and there's it creates chains. And there are some limits that have been placed on these chains such that I can only make that those links, I can only make 25 of those, at least in Bitcoin ABC, which is what, what the majority of miners are using at the moment. Mm -hmm. Something inherited from core. And so this had come up uh, because, and I just want to read this, I'll just read a little bit of this thing from Satoshi Dice. There was a post from the team at Satoshi Dice, and I guess that this issue, they've been running into this issue with people gambling. So as you can imagine, people are sort of gambling. Well, I'll, I'll, let, them, I'll let them explain it. So here is the, here is the post, and I'll, I'll put a link to this in the, in the show notes here. Uh, we, uh, let's see, a request from Satoshi Dice to the Bitcoin Cash community and a 1,000 BCH offer. We at Satoshi Dice fully support the vision of peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world, but in order to do more to help support this community, we need the 25 unconfirmed transaction limit raised. At one point, Satoshi Dice was the most popular cryptocurrency game in the world, and it can be again. The problem at the moment is that as soon as a player gets into a groove and making bets, they will hit the 25 transaction limit and need to wait until the next block to continue playing. This completely destroys the user experience and makes the players seek some alternative. It is almost as bad. This is the weird part. It is almost as bad as the one megabyte limit that was imposed by Blockstream on BTC and the reason we switched to BCH. If we can remove the 25 unconfirmed transaction limit before the end of this year, we will donate the next 1,000 BCH we earn up to 1 million euro value to the Bitcoin Cash Developer Fund. We have lots of things planned for the future, including a Satoshi Dice token, but in order to move ahead, we need this limit removed. This is why we are calling on the community to make a removal of this limit a priority. We thank you for your support of Satoshi Dice and a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system for the world. So uh, I guess this was back in August that, mm -hmm. that they did this. I want to I get this correct. Uh, yeah, back in August. And it just recently came up this week. And there, there were some even some developers at Bitcoin.com. I know there was a tweet from Roger. I don't want to put anything, uh, words into his mouth, but it looked like it was perhaps related to this and it had some insinuation about developers central plan centrally planning things. Mm -hmm. And I think especially the fact that it said that, you know, that there's this idea that it's somehow akin to this one megabyte limit. Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw like, okay, this could be a point where we could have this, this conflict come up that doesn't need to happen and we've had it before. So I wanted to yeah. bring you on because this is a problem that you've actually been working on. Mm -hmm. And we had talked about the fact that you were working on it before. And I was hoping that we could break this down sort of sure. simply. So I guess to start, I, uh, let's talk about Let's talk about the existence of this thing and sort of where it came from and, 
and why there is this limit in the first place. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it's it's due to Blockstream and the one megabyte limit. That's mm-hmm. why it's there. Um, basically, if you're planning to have a cryptocurrency with a one megabyte limit, you're going to have a mempool that is full of transactions, mm-hmm. which we've seen in the past. And in that case, you need some kind of quality of service mechanism so that people can make sure to get high priority transactions into a block and get them confirmed. And so if you you have 300 megabytes of transactions in the mempool, a block can only take one megabyte of transactions, miners are going to want to try to maximize the fees that they receive. Mm-hmm. And so um, you might end up with a situation where you have a, a transaction with a low fee, but another transaction that tries to spend one of its outputs that has a very high fee. Mm-hmm. And so if you only look at the first transaction as a miner, you would not be optimally choosing transactions to put in the block because including both transactions would be more valuable than say including something else that doesn't have any child transactions but has a slightly higher fee than the first transaction in the okay. other chain. So, okay, so let me, I may interrupt you from time to time just so that I can make sure that we've got this all clear. Sure, sure. Like, so if I've got this right, if, if we've got a transaction that goes in with let's say it's got a low fee, it's got a one mm-hmm. Satoshi per byte fee. Mm-hmm. But then I have a, I chain onto that. So that's the parent. Mm-hmm. I make a child transaction and it's got like a hundred Satoshi per byte fee. Yep. That, that then how miners actually look at that is they look at the combined fees across the bytes as opposed to looking, them, looking at them as two separate transactions. They look at them more as like one large transaction. Would that be a, a well? They a, a, would want to if okay. they want to optimize fees. Okay, got this it. This is just like how, how you would want to do it if you're trying to make as much fees as possible. Okay, have a surplus of transactions to look at, and that would you know the average of the fees per byte would be more so than say some other transaction that had a fee of two satoshis per byte, right? Because you know the right. average of those two transactions might be like fifty satoshis per byte, right. and that would be a really good deal if you're a miner. Okay. So that's the that's the thinking that Blockstream had around uh, changing the mining algorithm to include this child pays for parent concept. So this was part of getting um, this child pays for parent idea was part of them trying to solve their uh, their my transactions stuck in the mempool problem. Yeah, enabling a fee okay. market idea, okay. right? Like okay. if you have large blocks like you really don't need this very often unless right. somebody is like spamming the mempool or something like that um there's only like certain circumstances where it would be, be useful so the but and and this this limit was as i understand it this limit was introduced there was a limit introduced in 2015 but it was like a huge limit it was like a hundred ancestors or something like that or a thousand or something it was, it was something big and then this one was introduced this 25 limit was introduced later. Do you know what the impetus for continually lowering it to? What was the reason that it was lowered in the first place? I don't know what it originally was, but I can say so um, in in considering those packages, uh, what they're called the package of transactions, where you have more than more than one, you've got this chain. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could package those transactions. And in order to sort them properly, to put them in a block, you as new transactions come in, you have to keep this accounting up for each mm-hmm. transaction. Mm-hmm. So you have like one transaction, two transaction, a third transaction comes in, you have to update the fees associated with the first two transactions Got as it. well. So the fourth transaction comes in, you have to update the fees associated with the first three transactions. So this ends up being um, a nonlinear Uh, time complexity Mm -hmm. in the length of the chain of unconcerned transactions. So it starts to be a pretty expensive task to process these chains of transaction, both as they enter the mempool and as you add them to blocks. And when you say Uh, expensive, you mean uh, resource wise, you don't mean necessarily monetarily wise, right? Well, it's, it's both, right? Right. It's uh, it's some cop, it's some amount of time to, to do these computations and that sure. you know impacts uh, everybody's computers. Sure. Okay. Um, and, and potentially like orphan rates and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's a no, so it's a non-trivial issue the way that they've got it set up. It's not just as simple as 
well, let's just let's just change it. Because there are some people who are saying, well, let's just let's just everybody change it. What would be the outcome if? Because it it is. I know that it, it can be configured by each individual uh, mm-hmm. node operator. This is not something that's like hard coded in. It is a configurable. But what would be the possible outcome if, like, let's just say there are all the miners right now for whatever reason just decided, okay, we're going to pop that up to ten thousand, and people and Satoshi Dice started doing these ten thousand. What would we be looking at? What would be the outcome? What would we be looking at? Well, so there'd be two things. At 10,000, like the time to accept a chain of 10,000 transactions would be like 40 seconds or something like that. It gets very which, expensive. And, which, what's the time to accept? So that people can get some idea. What's the time to accept a single transaction? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I, I couldn't tell you. I don't have that off the top of my head, but it's in like, milliseconds so milliseconds as opposed to 40 seconds so that we can get yeah we can get an idea yeah and, and even accepting 10,000 non-chain transactions so 10,000 transactions being shot at the network at the same time but they're non-chain is not 40 seconds we're still talking in this millisecond range okay so yeah. that's something to understand that like there that that's going to create that's a that's a big problem Yes. Yeah. And the other thing that will happen is that people set these limits separately. Uh, transactions won't propagate across all the nodes in a, in, a, in a way in which you can be sure that zero comp is secure anymore, at least for chain transactions. But, you know, people could do double spends by abusing the fact that transactions are chained and not yes. propagating right. Okay. So, um, so I will include in the show notes... Uh, I did a video that's called doing easy double spends on dash. Uh, that was just because I knew of two nodes operated by explorers that had differing minimum. One was accepting no fee transactions and one had a one Satoshi per byte transaction. And it shows how when you have these different minimums, so some will relay and some won't, you could do a double spend, but could, could you just like briefly explain, uh, you know, at just at a simple level, how something would like that, what something like that looks like or how that can be exploited if you have these differing minimum levels of whether it's minor fee, whether it's chain transactions, whatever it is. Explain how that particular double spend works. Um, so basically, if there's nodes that are configured differently in terms of what they accept for relay transactions, uh, depending upon which miners uh, are essentially configured in the same way, a merchant could mistakenly uh, see a transaction on the network as being relayed, accept it, give you whatever merchandise they, um, that you're buying. But then when an actual block is mined, the actual consensus mechanism for Bitcoin, a different transaction would be in the block that would invalidate mm-hmm. the one that they had accepted as being valid previously. And it's actually the mining process which tells all the nodes what the, you know, the true and correct uh, state of the ledger is. Mm-hmm. And so by having differing uh, chain limits, you could end up in a situation where the 26th transaction was seen by a merchant, but not a miner. Right. And uh, some other transaction was accepted um, such that the merchant no longer receives their funds. Um, so, so it's important that as we move this limit forward that, or, or as we address this, that it's addressed in a sort of a, a network wide way that if some miners decide to change it, to, to raise it and other miners don't, it isn't like some of them mining bigger blocks and some of them mining smaller blocks. It actually opens up a, a possible double spend exploit if that's going on. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, and it is being worked on, right? Like this is not something that has been ignored. When did you start um, looking at this problem or what uh, this limit, right? When did you start looking at trying to find a way to, uh, to, to change this and to raise this limit with ABC at what point, like, like how long have you been, been looking at this? Shoot. I think, Somebody mentioned it to me probably in July or August of last year, mm-hmm. 2017. I started looking into it um, 
and investigating, you know, why the limit was there and and why it was expensive to, you know, accept these transactions and whatnot. It turned out to be a pretty substantial operation to remove that from the node. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I started actually writing code to address it, I think in February of this year. Um, I kind of set it aside for the time being because I'm, I'm not, you know, really focused on no development at this point, but I'd say a little bit over a year. Yeah. So, and I will, I will put a link to your blog post about this, which is excellent for people who want to dig into what the problem is, where the actual code is. I mean, you've got the actual code in there and you, you, you walk through it step by step and explain what the issue is. So, I mean, in, in terms of your findings, uh, can you, can you give an idea of, you know, you say that it's, you know, potentially difficult to get this out of there. Can you, can you give an idea of, you know, what type of effort would be required to make this change in ABC? So it, it, it depends on how you, you know, go about fixing it. But I can say that the code paths, because, because these packages are calculated progressively as transactions come in and the accounting of the mempool has to be kept consistent, uh, it impacts uh, block acceptance code, it impacts mining code, it impacts all the transaction acceptance code. Uh, there's thousands of lines of code in the in the code base that have to do with child pays for parent. It's a, it's very substantial and invasive change that they added in order to sort of enable this fee market uh, system. So, in removing it, you're touching a lot of things mm-hmm. and a lot of tests. So, lots of tests in the code base depend on this behavior. Um, so, you're adjusting all of those. Um, potentially breaking things there as you, you know, you're adjusting the, the tests while you're changing the code. That's a risky process as well because you're, you're actually changing the behavior. Um, and then, you know, I think the biggest thing that Omri is concerned about, aside from just changing this, is there's so much code that depends in it. There's, ABC depends heavily on backporting changes from uh, Bitcoin Core. Uh-huh. So every time you make a change to the Bitcoin Cash node code base, you now have places in the code where it becomes harder to backport things mm-hmm. or where backports don't merge uh, cleanly. And you have to like very carefully examine what those changes were, what uh, and how they potentially would impact the ABC code base. Like, for example, we, uh, Omri took all the SegWit code out of the ABC code base. Right. Um, and so anytime there's a backport that involves something with SegWit, you're like dealing with all this extra mm-hmm. witness commitment stuff and, and whatnot and trying to, you know, disentangle, uh, whatever, you know, SegWit dependencies were there. Mm-hmm. Um, so like anything touching the wallet or the GUI is very hard to backport right now. So this is a, this is a very good point. And I think that it's a point that is lost on many people who have never actually had to maintain a, a forked repository of, of another open source software project, especially one that gets as many uh, updates as, uh, you know, Bitcoin Core does. But, you know, the, and this is something that uh, Krista Rose is very good about bringing this up. I think Omri has brought it up before. Uh, what you're saying is, you're, you know, right now ABC is able to actually take advantage of the development work that is being done by the Bitcoin core team. And I mean, if people go and they look at the Bitcoin ABC or I mean, literally you could go and look at Dash, Litecoin, doesn't matter what it is, any of these forks, go and look uh, and at the, at the GitHub contributors and you will see that the top contributors are the top contributors to, of Bitcoin core. Uh, yep. <laughs> they're, they're still contributing code yep. and you'll see the graph. It still is contributing code that's coming in in terms of commits. So, you know, as you say, the, the, the more of these sorts of changes you make, the less you get to leverage the work that is being done by Bitcoin Core. So in some ways, we're able to you know, grab from them. ABC is able to you know, bug fixes, all of these sorts of things, little minor improvements, things that are going to make, make it better, are able to just grab it wholesale at the moment in many cases. And this yep. will prevent that sort of wholesale grabbing. Yes. I mean, it's... 
there's a lot of code impacted by child pays for parent. And so basically anything to do with mining or the mempool uh, at all is impacted. So uh, one other thing that I wanted to share because this gets, so, you know, basically this got, and for me it was notable and it's the reason why I wanted to have you on to talk about this. And I'm gl- thank you again very much for doing this is that um, this I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what the sort of spark was. But for a couple day, a couple days ago, it seemed like there were a lot of people that were talking about this, and there were some things said by some, you know, people who are leaders in the space that seemed as though they were insinuating that not adding this or not making this change was somehow either nefarious, lazy you know, the term central planning was kind of being thrown around. And, you know, there was even a response from Bitcoin Unlimited about this. And I just wanted to get your take on this. We talked about it a little bit before, but I just wanted you to put some context to this. If Peter Risen had a tweet that said, uh, Peter Shipper from BU has done the hard work to improve data flow in the node to permit longer chains of unspent transactions. We are two orders of magnitude faster than ABC. Hopefully he will be awarded the bounty when this work is released in Bitcoin Unlimited along with an increase in max chaining. So there's, there is this thought here. I mean, we already talked about the idea that setting these chain limits differently is going to be a yeah. problem. You know, I, as I understand it, Bitcoin Unlimited, because they, you know, they aren't inheriting the things from core, didn't have this child pays for parent issue. You know, what is your take on on sort of this on this being some sort of a a competitive pivot point like what is i'm i'm a bit ambivalent about it because i'm like well this is the market but i mean what is your you know what is your kind of take on on that sort of thing happening uh so i i don't know exactly when bu was forked i mean i've looked at it one time i'm not sure it was forked from bitcoin core as well Mm. Uh, I think it was forked before child pays for parent was yeah, added. So yeah. I don't, I don't think they really ever had this problem. Maybe they did. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't really satisfy the requirements because as far as I know, all the exchanges and miners run ABC at this point right. for a very good reason, right? Uh, Cause there's a, there's an economic incentive not to run anything else. I could speak so, to that a little bit. So let's say that like, Bitrex for want, wanted to run BU, for example. Mm-hmm. And let's say there's a chain split there because they're running a different code base than everyone else. Mm-hmm. Now, Bitrex is going to lose money, mm-hmm. right? It, because they're a single exchange running a different code base. They're now on a different fork. They're going right. to have to try to unroll all, all of the transactions that, uh, by transactions, I mean like actual exchange transactions, like their market orders that are executed. They're going to have to try to figure all of that out. The same thing's true for a miner. They mine a block that is not accepted right. by an ABC node. Right. Now they're out money. And so there's this very strong incentive for anyone that's actually economically dependent on what on node to all run the same one, right? And there's yes. no there's no way for them to sort of come to consensus on what they're going to run. Mm-hmm. Right? So they're going to choose whatever the default implementation is. Mm-hmm. For Bitcoin ETC, that's Bitcoin Core. And we see 98% of the nodes are, or more, are running Bitcoin Core there. On yeah, that and so, and that's why we had to fork, right? Because right. none of the exchanges would flip to Bitcoin Cash. They would, none of them would run ABC, right. Right? right? So we had to do a hard fork. The same thing's true in Bitcoin Cash. Like, the alternative nodes are great. I think that it's, it's very interesting and a worthwhile exercise. But from the perspective of actually, like, changing... Um, any kind of non-consensus relay, like soft mm-hmm. rules mm-hmm. or consensus rules, they, they, there's not much there. It's, it's following that you have to follow the leader, in other words. Like, even if you're running BU, you're still going to have to set your settings according to what whoever the leader is has his settings at. You, you, you don't have to, but you're not going to have any real impact on what's happening right. with, with, in terms of the network. Right. Um, and if merchants are running, uh, you know, BU with a long uh, 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 and allowing for long chains of unconfirmed transactions, they're putting themselves at risk. 
And um, I don't personally have an opinion on that. Like you could do it if you want, but mm-hmm. that's just, you know, ABC is effectively the, the shelling point for, uh, for node software. So, you know, in your, in your opinion, in terms of looking at this thing, I mean, if anybody, and I would advise everybody to go and check out your, your blog post on this, do you, I mean, you've worked on it. You've mm-hmm. actually, you know, sat down and, and, and laid code down for, you know, a solution. In looking at it, in looking at all of the things that we've discussed, you know, and, and also, and for me, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing something come in from Satoshi Dice. And when mm-hmm. I sort of queried the, the people in the community who were sort of making noise about this, and I said, well, besides Satoshi Dice, what are the other applications where you're mm-hmm. like, who else is really, I really got nothing back. Like I got the occasional, you know, oh, this guy over here and he's and he trying to do this. But, you know, I develop applications on the main net every day. I almost never run into this. You know what I mean? And I'll use mainnet and yeah. I'll throw, I'll chain transactions at it all day and I almost never run into this. What do, what, what do you think in terms of like the real, and again, it's not real or whatever, but your own interpretation, having looked at the problem, looked at the network, seeing what's out there, how big of an issue is this really? Uh, I think it's a pretty substantial issue actually. Okay. Uh, I don't work at Coinbase, so I can tell you, but this is... Uh, this is my understanding of like high volume exchanges like Coinbase and other, uh, other places is that they have their own wallet software that's built on top of the node mm-hmm. that has to do special UTXO management in order to support uh, the volume of withdrawals that they do. Because if they run out of uh, confirmed UTXOs, uh, they, you know, eventually they can't do withdrawals on the change anymore right. and they have to wait. Right. Um, and so this could impact anybody with enough volume for it to matter. Um, so it is an impediment to uh, some businesses. So it is something that needs to be changed. Um, as of but, that, that, there's also a, a one issue though as well, is that all of this is zero conf. Yes. And so as long as those transactions are malleable, there's still a potential that um, the chain could be broken through some type of malleation of a transaction while it's in the mempool. And that's still a risk for merchants. So unless there's either malleability fixes for the types of transactions that they're using, which I think is the case in coming in November, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, there, there is, Um, there is, there are some, I don't know if it's the final piece, but it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a force forcing the minimum op code, I think is, uh, is, is what's coming and that's going to make a difference for sure. So, yeah. So that's the other thing to consider is that uh, as long as they're in the mempool and not actually confirmed in a block, like uh, there is some risk there of the chain ending up being broken on some nodes and hmm. having some kind of double spend attack there as well. Um, probably so, not a high risk, but. So it is something that these high volume, so Satoshi Dice is obviously high, high volume and the major exchanges are high volume. Um, we're not hearing anything at the moment from exchanges, but it certainly seems like it is something that we could hear if BCH's volume started to increase. Mm-hmm. So it sounds to me, and tell me if this is a, 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 an adequate sort of uh, take on this if, this, if this makes sense, that the cost here is, it sounds to me like the major cost is going to be losing losing the ability to uh, merge changes from Bitcoin Core wholesale, increasing the amount of man hours that's going to be required to get those changes ready for merging uh, and make the necessary changes. And that, you know, that perhaps we run into a situation where Bitcoin ABC isn't staffed up necessarily to be able to handle it although they can't handle it now. Would you say that that is a, an adequate sort of take of the lay of the land right now? Uh, yeah, not only that, but there's, there's also risk in doing these changes. Right. Um, it's surprisingly easy to mess up <laughs> right. stuff. Um, and I totally understand Omri's, Omri's perspective on this. It's, it, is a, it is a big change. It does require maintenance work. Um, I, I don't believe that the developers are, are properly funded right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know 
that based on the economic activity in BCH that it like the developers are underfunded as a percentage. I couldn't uh, tell okay. you that, but I can tell you that um, the the options for developers are not uh, not competitive right now. And what I mean by that is um, you get piecemeal donations here and there, and no um, no guarantees on that you will continue to be funded, right? So in my case, where I was working on ABC and people are giving me donations here or there, I can't afford to leave a job market that mm -hmm. is expensive and go somewhere else to live and like be a Bitcoin monk. Right. I need to stay in the Bay Area where I can like go and get other work if something happens, um, which is what I ended up doing. Right. Um, but if I had moved to, I don't know, you know, Wyoming, some, uh, Wyoming or yeah. someplace to, you know, live off of the donations that I was right. receiving and then they just dried up, I would kind of, I would, I would be even worse off. Right. And, and I have right. a life. I want to have kids. I want to retire someday. Right. Like, uh, so either there needs to be some kind of stable funding for developers or it needs to, you know, match what, uh, what the going rate for a software engineer of the caliber required to work on this is. And there's not that many of them, honestly. Right. Um, so I think, so, you know, I mean, I think that's a great point and it's a point that's often lost on people, I, I think, because it's very easy to say, oh, you should make this change. But people don't understand that it's not only are you talking about the time that it's going to take to implement that actual code, but then, any fires that have to be put out after because bugs have been introduced, uh, the, the, the increase in time, as we've talked about, of merging changes from you know, uh, upstream in, the, in the, uh, the, the repo. And so you know, I, I think people forget that those of us who work in this space, are, we're professional software developers, and we're, a, we're able to work in software i mean it's, it's, yeah it's what we do it's not like we it's not like we're hard up for jobs if we're working in the space you know we we go to our recruiter and we say hey i'm in the, i'm in the market go find me a great new job you know what i mean and and so that we do this is because we're passionate about it and we're interested in it um and the compensation still isn't there as it is compared to a major company in the, in uh, silicon valley clearly yeah. so so you know i think that's something that gets lost and it's it's something that it, I think the community would be wise to remember those people who are asking for these changes to be made. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the offer from Satoshi Jice is, is surely very generous. Um, it wasn't, it's not very clear what the exact amount is from that, but, um, right. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's, that it's at least a step in the right direction and there's not a ton of businesses that are uh, in a position to sort of donate. Um, mm. But I, I, I will, I do want to make this point though, like Bitcoin cash, you know, and you've said this before is in some ways a movement. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wrong for the libertarian sort of anarcho capitalist freedom loving base of people to depend on businesses to fund it. Mm -hmm. Like I think that people should consider actually doing a tithe as part of their like commitment to freedom because fundamentally Bitcoin ABC, the software is a public good. And even if you're an anarcho capitalist, even if you're a libertarian, whatever, there's still a market failure there. The developers have of the node software have no way to make money. There's nothing that they can do that will generate a profit. They can do some side project and try to do some profit, but that takes away from it, right? They, they might as well not specialize in node development. They might as well be some other product and donate to actual node developers then. Like if you're going to be spending your time doing a wallet, you're not spending your time doing node development, mm -hmm. right? So everyone should, if they really care about it from like an actual, like we want to increase human freedom and flourishing, should consider doing some kind of monthly donation to um, to, to frankly, to Bitcoin ABC, the uh, Omri and Jason and the other guys, they don't receive enough funding. And even, I mean, the Catholic Church gets right. tons of funding this right. way, right? Like, right. right. If we if we 
if we believe what we say we believe, we should put our, you know, our money where our mouth is. And that's, uh, I know it's a strange concept because we think that like as capitalists, that everything should generate a profit, but there's still public works. There's still public sure. goods that, that sure. can't, there's a market failure there. Well, and, and, and you know, businesses donate uh, within the community that they're in to help raise the community up and provide for the things that communities, I mean, businesses, you know, donate parks and these sorts of, you know, take care of, of pieces of, of property and whatnot. That's that, I mean, that's a part of being a capitalist as well, I think, you know, Mm -hmm. and we, I think you're right. We do have a free rider problem. I think that we, we have people who are not putting their money where their mouth is. And I would be much more willing to listen to the, I think the first individuals who should be tithing are the individuals who are being the loudest about what changes should be made because (laughs) put some skin in the game. You know, tell me that if you don't, if, if the change is not made that you're going to withdraw your monthly tithe, people will, if you want people to listen, put your money where your mouth is. I think that's, that's a very good suggestion on your part. And I think it's economically sound and I think it's capitalist as hell. Yeah. So, I, I mean, the address is up on the Bitcoin ABC website. Um, it's not you know, necessarily clear who's donating what I know that some miners uh, essentially pay some kind of tithe out of the, the mining reward, but it's not even enough to really pay one person for you. Right. So, right. but uh, you know what you can, you can always donate to the address and then you can always sign a message, uh, you know, cryptographically sign a message showing that you had the private key to the UTXOs that were, that were donated and say, mm-hmm. this was, this, that's one thing you can do on Bitcoin. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so you can, it can be totally anonymous, but you can always prove like, hey, I donated this amount, man. And I'm saying, if you don't do this, I'm pulling it. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's a much stronger position for people to be in. I think that the community would be stronger for that. And I think also that a lot of the sort of grief and conflict would go away because you would know that the person who was talking to you had paid to put food on your table. That makes a big difference. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty as a developer uh, working on the project. And that, I think that impacts the decisions that are made a lot. Um, on the, on the flip side though, developers do need to listen and say that like, Oh yeah, the chain transaction limit, this is actually an important issue for customers. Like mm-hmm. it, it is impacting and like, this is, you know, maybe something we really should consider doing first over other things. Um, I, I don't think it's wrong to have for there to be some tit for tat with respect to, um, what the developer priorities are for the future of Bitcoin Cash and scaling, and then also what businesses need right now. I think that those there can be trade-offs there, right? It's not like all the donations mm-hmm. just go and like there's no consideration for what people actually need right now, and it's only for like long-term scaling. Um, so definitely room for more of a conversation on both sides there. Yeah, man, I think that's great, and I think that's a great place to end it off. Um, thank you again. This has been awesome. I think that people will get a lot out of this. This was important for us to do. Um, so hopefully we can come back and, and revisit this and some other things. I know that you're working on some, some great new projects that I can't wait to share with people because I'm super excited about what you're doing. So um, yeah, thank you. Shama Chancellor, thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Have a great one.